There's an emerging narrative out there on the most autismal tracts of the interwebs of the virgin American superhero comics versus the Chad manga. And look, it ain't like I blame people. American comics are crap. They just fucking are. Superheroes are too busy fucking bad guys to fight them. And that's when they're not crying about contemporary politics from an explicitly coastal commie perspective. It sucks ass through a coffee straw and each and every fucking one of us knows it. I may like to rag on manga but I get why it's appealing to so many lapsed superhero fans. It's simple. While it's much more woke than some of the most splitting shrieks of its ardent fans care to acknowledge, it still remains largely uncensored, and there's infinitely more variety than the cape shit cabal we're stuck with stateside. But what if I told you that every comic thread on Reddit that pushes an East versus West premise was full of fucking shit? What if I told you Western comics are not synonymous with American comics? What if I told you there's a thriving Western comic industry with stunning artwork, sleek graphic novel formatting, mature movie caliber scripts, and not a solitary superhero in sight? And what if I told you that per capita, it rivals and even eclipses both American comics and Japanese manga, while also accounting for a sizable amount of the sales from both, that it supports an industry that can actually justify the construction and continued profit of multi-story comic book superstores, frequented not just by juveniles or mentally adolescent man-children, but by absolutely everyone of all ages, from the youngest child to the most gnarled and arthritic granny. And what if I told you, it's in fucking France? Welcome, friends to the world of Bond Dessine, the greatest comic book market you've never heard of. Paris, France, one of the most culturally refined cities in the world, renowned for its architecture, its art, its food, and its comic books. As this store in Paris shows, the French have a passion for their comics, which they call Bond Dessine. Yodorowsky had, uh, had seen the film Dark Star that uh, John Carpenter and I had just made. Took me over to France, to Paris, and introduced me to some artists that he was using. And one of them was this amazing man named Jean Giraud. important points I want to impress upon you all with this video is that whether you know it or not, many of you have already read Bon Dessine, or at least its many offshoots. It's just that thanks to a distribution model that can best be described as a five alarm dog shit fire, rather than being romanticized, specially advertised, and marketed as the exotic and unique industry that it is, as Western purveyors of manga wisely did in the 80s and 90s, BD are instead unceremoniously diffused in and amongst American Cape comics in a method wildly incommensurate with their quality. More or less shit out onto the US market with a marketing budget of 20 bucks in Mullow Cup money and translations that make the interpreter at the Nelson Mandela funeral look like a linguistic fucking scholar. Case in point, a few years back, Marvel Comics entered into an agreement with European publisher Soleil Comics, one of the foremost factories for Bon Dessine and did dick all with it outside of a few localizations for shit like Sky Doll, which was profoundly fucking pointless as Heavy Metal Magazine had already localized that comic a half a damn decade previously. You may have witnessed the work of many of the more famous faces in the BD artosphere even. Did you like those Marvel Zombies covers back in the day? Well, the man who painted them is a Heavy Metal mainstay since the earliest days of the magazine when it was still an American variant of French mega comic Metal Erlon. On était tous comme des prédateurs en train de fondre sur le, le marché de la forme dessinée. Metal Hurlant a vraiment révolutionné le, le petit monde de l'édition à travers le, le monde entier, hein, à travers l'Europe, les États-Unis et même le Japon. Or what about the infamous Spider-Woman dead-ass variant Marvel censored the shit out of when it was deemed too lurid to print as is? 
You can thank Milo Manara, Italian artist par excellence, and a master of watercolored comics who spent half his career on historical fiction and fantasy and the other half being horny on Maine. My point is, I want to demystify BD a bit. It's not some pretentious, far-flung Frenchy bullshit. These are comics you may actually recognize if you saw their American counterparts, and if you don't, you would certainly recognize their influence on American media. Which brings me to my first recommendation. After a while, Giraud got tired of me uh, standing and looking over his shoulder while he drew, so he asked me to go and write him a comic book story a graphic story that he could publish in his magazine, Metal or Lot. It was, of course, a film noir in the future. I didn't think about it a bit for many months until uh, an American publisher decided to publish Metal or Lot in an English language edition. They call it heavy metal. Perhaps no single BD has been quite so influential, frankly, in America or fucking Japan, you're welcome, Akira, as a simple two-chapter short story originally published in Metal or Lawn in the late 70s, The Long Tomorrow. The premise? It's the future. There's flying cars. And we follow a simple private dick as he unravels a mystery involving conspiracy, androids, and fake fucking humans. Do please stop me if you've heard this ditty previously. Lavishly illustrated by, for my money, the greatest comic artist that ever lived, the almighty Mobius, and written by Dan O'Bannon. Yes, the fella fired out a little script called Alien, the concept of future noir, whatever the hell it was before synthwave and bad video games got a hold of it, started here. As such, it's no exaggeration to say cyberpunk, at least in a visual context, begins in this single throwaway comic story, serving as the visual and stylistic framework for fucking Blade Runner. Qui a, qui a eu beaucoup de succès, et d'ailleurs qui a été un peu en comment je pourrais dire, qui a servi euh, à Ridley Scott quand il a fait euh, Blade Runner. I was very much engaged by the heavy metal comics and was looking very closely at people like Jean Giraud Mobius who I still regard as probably the father of it all and one of the best. It was also semi-adapted in animated form as the Harry Canyon segment of 1981's heavy metal feature film. New York, big deal. Scum center of the world. Now they're even talking about letting in low lives from other planets, too. My name's Harry Canyon. I drive a cab. It's nothing too deep and only complex enough to be sufficiently fucking weird, and that's why it works. The Long Tomorrow feels like precisely what it was. Dan O'Bannon having a hell of a lot of fun fucking around with 40s lingo in a sci-fi setting, securing the knowledge that Mobius would transmogrify it into high art, which is precisely what he did. A single panel of The Long Tomorrow is suffused with such dizzying detail it would likely be a double page splash in most manga or American comics, but the blinding detail isn't the main event. As the man himself said in the afterword of his collaboration with Stan Lee on Silver Surfer Parable, a drawing is much more than a mere collection of details. Which is why it's also the fucking framing, the gesture work, the sense of motion that propels the tale forward. An entire generation of cyberpunk fiction received its visual iconography from this one comic and its myriad stylistic offshoots. Oh, and George Lucas, you're quite welcome for the fucking probe droid, you fucking Pelican next. Hey, you uh, remember the first few seasons of Game of Thrones when the intrigue was still intriguing, the writing was still tighter than a bureaucrat's asshole, and the entire point of the show wasn't to watch cousins butt fuck in front of a blue screen? Yeah. Well, France, it seems remembered what made Game of Thrones watchable, and the early novels readable, inserted it into a comic book time capsule, and out popped Servitude, a politically charged fantasy epic lavishly rendered by graphic art archon Eric Bouget. Bit of upfront warning though, like a lot of phone book fantasy novels, this one starts off with more clunky exposition than 17 Metal Gear Solid cinematics stacked on top of each other. So if you're averse to hearing about the bygone days of the clan dwarves fighting the Fingal Fucks at the Battle of Made Up Topia, your eyes may well glaze the fuck over, at least initially. But I promise, if you hang with it by the halfway point, the first book 
book picks right the hell up, the personal enmity of the principal cast takes over, and the here be shit dicks lore humping falls by the wayside in favor of a proper personal fucking fantasy story. And I do mean a proper fantasy story. Whereas most examples of the genre necessarily pare back their monumental scope to spare the average audience member unnecessary confusion, this reads like a full fantasy book in graphic novel form with all the good, the bad, and the bullshit that comes along with that. But I promise, if you stick with it, you'll get a solid six volumes, two of which are already in English, of Game of Thrones as it might have been. Sumptuously illustrated in stunning sepia tones, which is a plus on the eye candy front, but somewhat of a minus when all the princes, dukes, and kings have the same complexion, where the lack of eye-popping color makes distinguishing between the 20 of them a chore of Sisyphean proportions. On the plus side, though, as perhaps a byproduct of the approach as the comic catapults forward, Eric Bougier appears to compensate for this with some truly eye-popping line art decisions. From the distinct heraldry of the nobility to the East Asian samurai aesthetics of the half-dragon race, the Drekkar, by the end of volume one, this bitch could be in black and white and you'd still know these fucks on a first-name basis. Servitude ain't perfect, and as fantasy BD go, I'd probably recommend one or two above it, but bitch, I already recommended the Elric Bond Dessine, and of all the examples of the genre I've read in the recent past, Servitude stands alone as utterly committed to its staggering scope. Next! <laughs> ads were in a vice on this video. No, not literally, I'm not the amazing atheist, but the operative issue was that I had a bit of an embarrassment of riches on my hands. In short, France fucking loves a good Western. And as I couldn't very well go without mentioning the Mobius comic that Cyberpunk swiped its absolutely everything from, I couldn't very well justify discussing what is essentially the man's life's work, Blueberry. Years ago, I, I think I had seen a Western strip called Blueberry. And I thought, gee, this is really good. And how can it be drawn by a French artist? J'ai eu le, le comment le pressentiment de faire d'un seul coup un personnage qui n'existait pas en bande dessinée, c'est-à-dire un personnage euh, avec une, une, une charge d'animalité et de sexualité que les autres n'avaient pas. Hein, le, quand on regarde euh, Tintin, <rire> c'est vrai qu'il n'est pas très sexué. Starting in the 60s, the Blueberry series ushered in a new kind of comic book cowboy, a synthesis of the scope of the old school John Ford Westerns like The Searchers with the all important edge of the spaghetti Westerns of its own epoch. You see, Mobius is not just a pseudonym, it's a title he gave to a specific style of comic art credited only to himself. Jean Giraud, the man behind Mobius, put his name happily to the Blueberry saga and his seminal turn on the series and its offshoots, Lieutenant Blueberry and Young Blueberry has ensured the Western remains one of the most popular genres in France to this very day. No one makes cowboy comics like the fucking French. One of the latest examples of this emerged in 2015 with the launch of the excellent Undertaker. But before we do cringy cartwheels down WWE Boulevard, understand this is actually a case of WWE imitating the Western rather than the other way around. The Undertaker was conceived by the company in question as an Old West Undertaker, one named Kane, interestingly enough. And so it stands to reason it was all but inevitable there would eventually be an ongoing comic about the Old West conception of an Undertaker. And France being fucking France, of course, they did it first. Positively stinking of the spaghetti western style, keen fans of the genre will easily identify elements of Sartana and even lighter hearted western comedies such as My Name is Trinity, all filtered through the Franco-Belgian blueberry lens, to the point that early promotional art for this series by illustrator Ralph Meyer even included iconography from Blueberry. Alors il est évident que dans les, les, réfé les références, la première c'est Blueberry, qui a été vraiment une... Euh 
euh, un, un vrai choc euh, adolescent. J'ai vraiment euh, adoré cette série. Mais la dernière séance aussi, avec tous les westerns qui passaient, euh, était vraiment un des, des grands euh, moments pour moi dans la semaine, euh, en étant enfant. Le western américain, mais aussi italien, je veux dire, le, le, les Sergio Leone, c'était vraiment euh, des films marquants. Ralph Meyer, for his part, has been called the modern Mobius. And looking at his inks alone, I ain't even about to argue. Better still, it's in English, folks. In fact, it's currently available on Amazon, albeit not fucking physically yet. Look, BD hasn't quite kicked up the shitstorm stateside that manga has, but make enough noise about it, folks. And just like manga and anime of the 80s and 90s, eventually someone's gonna wise up and make a proper push for this shit stateside. And it's a shame, as the physical release the fucking Frenchies got is goddamn gorgeous, full of watercolored concept art and even two-page posters, and the translation of the Kindle version is actually a cut above the usual bon dessinée fare. This is a classic spaghetti style western with a modern comic storytelling sensibility such that inside all the superb art there's a story that moves like a greased turd down a slip and slide. Moi ce que j'aime dans le western c'est que c'est en réalité une tragédie grecque. C'est-à-dire on a un lieu isolé qui est presque une scène de théâtre avec en fait peu de moyens. C'est-à-dire que euh, oui il y a des grands espaces, oui il y a des Winchester mais c'est des lieux très codifiés. Le saloon, la prison, la grande rue. Et là, euh, on raconte des conflits essentiellement de personnages. Là, en l'occurrence, c'est la volonté euh, d'un monomaniaque euh, millionnaire contre la volonté de, et le besoin de justice, en tout cas le pense-t-il, euh, de, de mineurs, opposé à le bon vouloir et l'amusement finalement d'un Undertaker. Et cet esprit-là, le western comme théâtre de la justice, théâtre de la société, et donc quelque part théâtre grec, c'est le western américain dans ce qu'il a plus classique, qui va de 3h10 pour Yuma, l'ancien bien sûr, Delmer Daves, en passant par l'homme qui tue à Liberty Valence, l'étrange incident, euh, Rio Bravo, ce type de western là. Et moi, c'est ceux-là, finalement, qui m'ont le plus touché. And with a story now six volumes deep, there's plenty of it to enjoy already. Undertaker is outright excellence. Alors la collection chez Glena s'appelle Conan le Cimérien et non Conan le Barbare. Conan le Barbare, c'est le Conan des films, c'est le Conan des bandes dessinées, c'est le Conan que la plupart des gens connaissent. Euh, c'est le mythe, je vais dire. Et nous, en fait, on, dans cette collection, on va revenir aux origines du mythe, à savoir l'œuvre littéraire de Robert Howard. Il faut savoir qu'à aucun moment dans les nouvelles, euh, Howard écrit Conan le Barbare. Une différence majeure avec tout ce qui a pu exister jusqu'à aujourd'hui, c'est que les adaptations de Conan, elles sont principalement, je dirais même uniquement américaines. Nous, on va apporter une vision qui est européenne, française même, avec donc différentes visions du personnage pour avoir différents aspects, différents looks, différentes tenues, et le tout dans un style graphique européen. Là, c'est vraiment une vraie nouveauté puisqu'on n'a jamais fait ça auparavant. Poor put upon Conan. Oh, sure, in its purest prosaic form, Robert E. Howard's most popular creation, even almost a century after its initial publication, still pulses with pulp energy. But if the books enjoy a nigh perpetual season of plenty, the comics go through more famines than communist Chinese agriculture. Conan comics are like Kurt Cobain's brains. They're all over the fucking place. Those black and white, uncensored, savage sort of Conan comics kick ass, even if the adaptations are about as faithful as Vince McMahon in a massage parlor, but then they hit the skid some years later, only for Dark Horse to come along and crank out perhaps the definitive comic book run for the fucking character. 
At which point, Marvel bought the license for the barbarian in question and shit the bed in biblical fashion. But while American readers rolled their eyes at Disney Marvel wasting one of the most enduringly popular literary creations ever made, over in France, they were quietly creating perhaps the finest take on the character to ever grace a goddamn comic page. Building on the success of the excellent Elric BD series, Glenna Bond Dessinée set out to do likewise with the Sultan of Sword and Sorcery, but this time they did things a little differently. Perhaps because they were burned out on the original Elric creative team breaking the fuck up and delaying several volumes by fucking years, they elected instead to allow a new creative team to author each individual volume, with each representing a new adaptation of a classic Howard story, each with their own unique artwork and interpretation of the character. The approach proved to be the greatest strength and weakness all rolled into one. When one of these Conan volumes hits gold, god damn, is it great. And America has never even touched this quality. The blindingly beautiful Frost Giant's daughter and near photorealistic Hour of the Dragon simply have never been touched anywhere in the East or West. But then there were one-offs where it didn't work quite as well, such as the beautifully colored but cartoony Queen of the Black Coast. It ain't outright awful, but Dark Horse did it better, folks. Understand, this book really is the exception to the usual BD approach. Look, these books, much like manga, frankly, are generally attached to a single creative team, often for goddamn decades. To rotate out like this is sort of out of the path for most BD creators, and it shows at times on Conan, but one thing's for sure, even the weakest entry in this series smokes Marvel and most of Dark Horse. And with hardcover translations, which included the original Robert Howard text of the story, it is no exaggeration to call this the most faithful comic Conan ever envisioned. Sadly, however, thanks to Marvel Bogart and the rights, the comics couldn't be published as Conan in the States, so instead look for the Sumerian hardcovers on Amazon if you've pined for a proper Conan comic during the dark ages of Disney Marvel. Buy it by Crom! Next! Il y avait d'abord avant tout Giro, qui était mon maître à penser et à dessiner plus exactement. Depuis, bon, je crois que je devais justement avoir 14-15 ans quand j'ai découvert le Blueberry. Et c'était la, la, la toute grande époque où Blueberry explosait. Avec, euh... Et comme j'étais passionné de western, eh bien c'est, c'est sur eux que je, je me suis branché vraiment. Et je dirais que c'est en regardant ces dessinateurs-là que j'ai plus appris mon métier qu'à l'école. If Mobius and Blueberry put BD Westerns on the map, or Western Nouveau as they came to be called in their country of origin, then the man who steered into the Spaghetti Western and stayed there was a brother from Belgium by the name of Yves Svolfs. With a formal art education at one of the more respected academies of any art form, this cat could have done anything at all in his chosen field. But being from fucking Belgium in the 80s, that meant all he wanted to do was draw fucking cowboys. But if Blueberry had been a stern-jawed and stoic Charles Bronson figure with a side of Sergio Leone, Svolfs saw the potential in the other Italian Sergio director, Corbucci. Darker, more violent, and not quite as fucking pretentious as Sergio Leone, Corbucci was a seminal figure in films of the period. Navajo Joe was a revisionist action western starring Burt Reynolds, and Django was important enough for Quentin Tarantino to make an inferior fucking reboot of. But Spolf's, like myself, preferred a once forgotten film in Corbucci's oeuvre. The stark, snowy spaghetti western. The Great Silence. And by preferred... I mean, ripped it off so hard you'd think he was, Quentin fucking Tarantino. If you haven't seen it, you should, and be sure to let me know which ending you prefer, as I certainly have my own opinions on the matter. But it's a clunky fucking masterpiece that has only risen in the esteem of audiences and critics alike since its 1968 release. I say all of this because the first volume of Durango is 
basically an unofficial graphic novel adaptation of The Great Silence, with a few minor changes to the names and plot for purposes of not getting fucking sued. But in lieu of a mute gunfighter, the titular Durango is more of a synthesis of Django, Silence, and Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name, a man of few words rather than none. Yet as the series wore on, Durango became more his own man, though he never stopped looking like Jean-Louis Plantignon in The Great Silence. Rest in peace, by the way, you French fucking legend, you. I mean, folks, it's a spaghetti Western comic with jaw-dropping pre-Raphaelite artwork featuring six shooters and fucking machine pistols. It's like this country makes comics exclusively for fucking me. Sadly, unlike the previous entries on this list, not to mention the author's most recent Western output, Lonesome, Durango has never been translated stateside into English until now. Folks, I love this series so much and have wanted to see it in English for so impossibly fucking long. I went ahead and translated it myself. Link in the description. Fuck 4chan's false binary of superheroes versus manga, motherfucker! You don't have to choose between bisexual boy fuckers in spandex onesies or animal waifs with windshield size eyeballs, idiosyncratic art, shitty anatomy, and bad writing. And a fair bit of the latter is even inspired by French comics. You can have excellent art and non-superhero subject matter. Everything from historical fiction to noir to western to sci-fi to fucking fantasy. And if you make enough noise, the stuff that ain't yet in English easily fucking can be. Bon dessiné is proof positive that the cheese may be soft, but French comics go fucking hard. I'm Razor Fist. God fucking speed. <laughs>